Well, I'm going to talk now to Peter Merry from Norfolk Constabulary and uh, Andrew Baxter from the Crown Prosecution Service. Peter, does that kind of thing really make somebody keep to the straight and narrow? What you've seen in, in two of your clips is kind of just two of the very kind of range of options we have in actually dealing with offending behaviour. Because in dealing with offending <coughs> behaviour, it's more than just punishment. Um, it's about rehabilitation. It's around reintegration into communities. You know? I can see a lot of people watching this will say, you know, I don't do anything wrong, I don't get into trouble with the police, I would love to learn to make a cartoon film and nobody's going to let me do it. Why should they let somebody who's been in trouble do it? What we're looking at is, is what will change that, that offending behaviour for the future. And if you look at the success we've had in Norfolk, our, our offending rates you know, and our crime rates gone down 24% over the last three years because of how we use those range of options. We are proportionate, we are appropriate, we look at the needs of the victims, the, the, the requests and requirements of the communities and also then the, kind of the needs of the, the offender around how we can change their offending behaviour. And you know, yes, there is a degree of punishment, but we also need to rehabilitate and we also need to repair the harm done, not let only in their lives but in the lives of their communities as well. Let me just bring in Andrew now, Andrew Baxter. Um, there's, there's been talk today that actually uh, there is a cost element to the people that you will bring forward for prosecution. How much are, you, are your hands tied by the cost of bringing prosecutions? Uh, well, Stuart, no organisation has infinite resources and, and it's very important that we work efficiently uh, and that we prosecute uh, the right people. We get the charges right first time. Uh, last year in Norfolk, we prosecuted 16,000 cases. Uh, we had an 88% conviction rate. And we worked very closely with all our partner agencies to make but, sure... But you, you must be tight for money. All, all organisations are tight. The, the public sector is experiencing a difficult time at the moment, and, and that's why we have and to And so be... there are some people where you won't bring a case to court because you can't afford it? Uh, that we haven't reached such stages yet. We have to identify the serious cases, but we also have to look at alternative solutions uh, instead of prosecuting uh, to deal with some of the less serious crime. Uh, okay. And we have a number of solutions there. Good. Both of you, thank you very much for being with us. We'll be back at Court 4 at Norwich Crown Court later in the programme when we'll be talking to some barristers and to some of these young students. But for now, the news where you live. Hello, let's take a closer look at the news now from Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk. And the region's out-of-hours GP service is under attack again tonight, this time from a man who accuses the company TCN of failing to look after his ex-wife. He says she died after medics failed to diagnose her condition. Susan Barrett had been complaining of dizziness and headaches for several days. She then lost the sight in one eye and that evening visited the Riverside Clinic in Ipswich. She was told she had high blood pressure, sent home and advised to see her GP. The following morning, she collapsed and died. We subsequently found out that Sue died of a, um, a subacroid haemorrhage, um, which we've also been told is a, a very serious condition, but a relatively easy condition to diagnose and um, she should have been diagnosed with that and been referred to Ipswich Hospital. It's the latest in a series of complaints about Take Care Now. Stephen Stemmer was left in intense pain for nine hours with a suspected blood clot on his lung. After his wife repeatedly called them for help, she gave up and phoned an ambulance. He's now recovering, but for Susan Barrett, it was too late. Her death has affected the whole family. Sue died two years ago. And, uh, you know, things are still going on today and I am absolutely dissatisfied with anything to do with the Take Care Now. And Philip Barrett is now taking legal action against the company. We asked Take Care Now to be interviewed. They declined but sent us this statement. We can confirm that we received a complaint from Mr Barrett and this is going through our formal complaints procedure. We will continue to respond to Mr Barrett directly. Philip Barrett says the experience has left his whole family with a mountain to climb. Felicity Simper, BBC Look East. The former Norwich footballer Callum Davenport has been charged with assaulting his sister following an incident in which he was stabbed in both legs. The West Ham star was injured while at his mother's home in Bedfordshire in September. The 26-year-old player spent six days in intensive care in hospital after the incident. Norfolk Police are looking for a new Chief Constable this evening. The current holder of the post, Ian McPherson, is to join the Met in London as Assistant Commissioner. Mr McPherson became Norfolk's Chief Constable at the start of 2007. 
Elizabeth Truss is facing a deselection battle in southwest Norfolk just days after winning the race to become the Tory election candidate. Some local conservatives are angry that she didn't reveal an affair with a married MP. Her fate will be decided at a meeting next month. The nuclear industry says building new power stations here would help the region recover from the recession. Hundreds of contracts worth billions of pounds would be up for grabs. A business in Colchester which makes huge fans is just one of the firms that could benefit. Fans don't come much bigger than this. These will keep air flowing through railway tunnels. They're the biggest we do here at Colchester. They're actually 2.5 metres in diameter. The main construction is actually um, fabricated mild steel welded together, uh, formed through various machines. The impellers, which is the, the spinny roundy thing in the middle, I guess, uh, is made of aluminium for weight reasons. These two beauties are just two of the 100,000 or so fans this factory churns out every year. A new fleet of nuclear power stations will generate millions of pounds worth of extra business. I understand the arguments about nuclear power and that some people find it offensive, but from a business perspective, yes, we would like to see the approval given to start straight away. And at a conference in Newmarket today, the nuclear industry was spreading the message about the possible economic benefit. There's experience in the region of nuclear power. Companies have the expertise, they have the capability. The opportunities are now coming up again. We've got investigation works for the ground. We're looking at the planning submission at the moment. We're looking at the nuclear site licence. And we're looking at the generic design assessment with NII. So this is a reality. It's been suggested that new power stations could be built at Bradwell in Essex, close to the old one and also at Sizewell in Suffolk. But anti-nuclear campaigners say the economic benefits wouldn't be worth the risk. Gareth George, BBC Look East. Lowest of Town joint manager A.D. Gallagher has hailed his team's incredible performance in their FA Cup fourth qualifying round replay. They beat Gloucester City 4-2 last night to reach the first round proper for the first time since 1977. Meanwhile, South End United have been given a week to settle a huge tax bill or face a winding up order. Officials from HM Revenue and Customs are seeking to place the League One club into administration over the £690,000 debt. They'll now face an administration hearing on the 4th of November. Figures out today show that some of East Anglia's most threatened birds are making a comeback. Numbers of the bitten, for example, have trebled in 10 years. But the British Trust for Ornithology in Thetford also says there's been a big fall in some common birds. Just have a listen to this, Alex. It's a fabulous sound. <laughs> the sound of a skylark above Chris Skinner's Norfolk farm. Passionate about birds, he's let 10 acres lie fallow so they can safely nest. He's encouraged rough hedgerows and planted wild bird mix for them to harvest. So there are ten varieties of seeds grown here, only for consumption by the birds on the farm. When I last visited Chris, he blamed intensive farming for the demise of farmland birds. So, eight years on, have we learnt anything? There's more and more pressure on the countryside, and that pressure is translating through to our farmland birds. They just cannot exist in the aggressive arable environment which we have today. In just over a decade, the skylark population is down 11%. Others have fared worse, like the cuckoo, nightingale and grey partridge. Among the worst hit, the turtle dove, down 66%. The survey was co-written by Andy Musgrove. He's heartened that the bittern has recovered, but is worried about migrating birds, such as the cuckoo. Because you're dealing with birds that may cover 10 or 20 countries in, their, in the course of a year, um, coming up with solutions and teasing apart the different uh, problems that they might be uh, facing, yes, is that much more difficult. Chris Skinner has made a start, but these birds' chances of a long-term comeback are stacked against our growing global demand for cheap food and more land. The odds aren't great. Alex Dunlop, BBC Look East, Norfolk.